Okay, uh, grab your Bibles. Um, we are going to be in the book of First John this morning. We're continuing our Getting to the Core series. If you guys uh, don't have a Bible, I mean, you certainly can use your phones. That's fine. Otherwise, we have a whole bunch of Bibles in the back. Uh, there by uh, Josh and Stacy. She's walking around. You can go ahead and grab one of those Bibles to follow along. First John, a little book way in the back, not the book of John. First John, we're going to go further back into the Bible. Uh, we're going to continue on. John kind of introduced us last week to uh, the term uh, abide. What does it mean to abide or abiding? And the song we sang is so timely. Uh, I'm sure Mariel said we'll be singing it again, the song Abide. Not necessarily today, but we will again. What does it mean? What does it mean to abide? It's such a term. Why are we spending two weeks on this term? Because it is that important. I, I listened to the sermon last week, and I've been thinking all of this week, talking with John, talking with people about where do we, how do we continue to expand this term? How do we continue to go deeper with it? Because it's important enough that we want to spend this much time with it. And, I'm, and I've been wrestling all week because it's a term that it's just hard to describe. It's just hard to talk about the word abiding or remaining because it's like, how do, you, how do you explain that? How do you talk about that? Because we often think of the word stay put, and I immediately go to how I would train a dog, stay. And that's, that's not necessarily a good enough description of what it means to abide in Jesus. It isn't, it isn't enough to just say remain, to be there, because we think of physical places. We think of things that we have to do. We're very action-based people. But this is so much more than that. So we're in 1 John, and we're going to kind of unpack. We're going to be in chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 28, and we're going to read through chapter 3, verse 2. So uh, as I've said before, just because there's a chapter there does not mean we have to stop, and it's a separate thought. Those are put in later. Those are not part of the original. So we're just going to go 28, 29, 1, and 2, and we're going to talk about what it means to abide. So... Maybe an, a, an analogy that I have found helpful in the way that I think about things is we live in a culture of YouTube, right? Uh, for me, that means if I have a question about something, I can literally Google it and it will tell me how to do it on YouTube. I've done all sorts of things that I never thought I would do just because I found out a video that shows me exactly how to do it. And so we can become experts at literally everything and anything that we want to be just by simply typing in on our phones and listening in a matter of 10 or 15 minutes. And we've become that way in so many things. And what is the result of that is people, as you have probably noticed in the world, have become extremely opinionated. I, I think this is funny because everyone's an expert in something, even though I've had conversations with people about certain things, and I know full well that you're talking about something that you have actually never done. And we, we do this all the time. And one of the, the, the big areas that has got a big culture online is the, the culture of smoking meats. Okay? Just bear with me. Okay? And one of the biggest things you can do is, if you can do this, is to smoke a brisket. The smoke of brisket's kind of the pinnacle. Once you've done that, then you have achieved master, pit master, grill master, whatever title you want to do. That's what it is. And you can watch hours and hours and hours of video. You can read all sorts of articles on how to do this and all sorts of things you can do. This is how you want to bind it. This is the season you want to use. This is the smoke you want to do. This is how long. This is the temperature. And all sorts of opinions raging all over the place. But you know what really helps you learn how to smoke a brisket? Is actually smoking a brisket. So many people are on there throwing opinions around, they don't actually know because they've never actually done it. it it's just this, this gap of knowledge of I can learn everything possible, but to actually do it, it's a different type. And this is actually where we're going to get in 1 John because he's going to use the word know quite a few times in these, just these four verses. But what we can't see in the English is what the Greeks did is they had two types of know. They have the know of I just know. I just have this general knowledge of I just know this thing. And then they have the know of I know this because I have done it. And he's going to distinguish it. And it's very important we distinguish that. Because as we abide in Christianity, as we abide in Jesus, as we're learning to do that continually, we can't separate or we can't solely rely on just the things that I have I just know about. I just know the statistics. I just know the facts and think that's a substitute for spiritual maturity. 
That's not what we want to do. We don't want to be the opinionated blogger on the other side throwing out opinions out when we actually don't know because we've done it. Does that make sense? They go hand in hand. To just walk in and just start doing stuff, you can, fine, you can stumble your way through something, but we need both of these. You need to know Jesus, but you need to know Him. So it's kind of that weird tension that we're going to get to in 1 John. So, now you know. You can go back. John's going to come back. He's helping uh, Mitch and Brittany move into their new home. And you can come back and, hey, what did Joel talk about? He talked about briskets. Okay. <laughs> did you learn anything? Not really. No, it's fine. <laughs> Not really. So, uh, 1 John, we're going to start in 28. And it says, And now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink back from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness have been born of him. So we have that word right away. Abide. Abide in him. Abide in him. What on earth does that mean? Is it just a place that we, we find? Is it a certain thing we go to? It's like, oh, here is my spot. Here's my abiding place. And for 15 minutes in the morning, I'm going to go and I'm going to abide. It's this, is it a physical place? It's more than that. Is it, is, it just this, uh, is it just a mindset change? No, it's more than that. Is it just something that I use in my language as Christians to say, I'm just, I'm just abiding now? Is it just another term for quiet time? No, it's more than that. How do you, and this is what I wrestle, how do you even begin to put descriptors on this term of abiding? Because this is an all-encompassing term. It's not just things that I know about. There are things that I know how to do. It's, uh, if, you, if you think of the, uh, if you, the famous psalm, Psalm 46, there's that verse in there that says, Be still and know that I am God. We, we love that verse because it's this idea of don't do things. Don't do still. You can't do still. You have to be still. It's this idea of remaining. It's this idea of being somewhere without, making our, without realizing that I have to do something or letting our mind drift to all the things that I have to do. It's this, this idea of contentment, of being in a place like home. That's actually where the word comes from, is that the Latin word abode, which means home. It's different. It's like being in our sanctuary. It's being in the place where I am comfortable, being in the place where I am me. Being in the place where I am fed or being in the place where I grow, being in the place where all of my important decisions stem from. That's, that's the place of, of abiding. That's the place we want to be. But here's the thing that's so unique about Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. That Psalm talks about we can do that because there's this river that runs through Jerusalem that feeds us. And what's so fascinating to me is that there actually isn't a physical river that runs through Jerusalem. So what is he getting at? It's, it's the river of Christ. It's the, it's the river of God. That's what I am feeding off of. This is, it's so timely that we finish all the series in Psalms. He makes me lie down on green pastures. I seek my heart with all that I am. Find, seek, search me and know me. All of these expressions of where our heart is in relationship to God. It's not about what do I do, where do I turn, give me the directions. But it's again challenging our hearts of who am I in relationship to God and how can I be in a place before Him open and honestly and receiving contentment and life and direction. It's a place not of I go to to do this. It's a place that I want to be in all of my life, every minute of it, because all out of this abiding, this relationship, this intention I have with my Jesus comes my decisions and my life filters and the things that I view in this life are all affected by this position that my heart is in. We call it abiding. So here we have 1 John and now little children. Now he's not writing this letter to little children. He's writing this to a church. This is the same John who wrote the book of John, but he's now writing a couple letters to churches trying to encourage them. And he's saying, Often he refers to them as the little children in this passage. And it's not something derogatory. It's meant to be a, an encouraging challenge to the church. Little children. Because we think back to the things that Jesus said. If you want to come to me, you must be like a child. Little children abide in him. It's this reminder of the, sim the simplicity, the absolute basicness of just loving Jesus and wanting to be around him. 
Not doing it out of a, necess a necessary action or doing it out of a task to fulfill. But I just want to be. As a child wants to be in the room with someone they like, so we should want to be in the room with someone that we like. The someone who loves us and we love them. Abide in Him. And now, and you guys know me, I, I'm, a, I'm a nerd. So bear with me as we point out a very important word choice, because we're going to pick up on it. Uh, if you're a Bible marker like me, I have it circled, because it's very important that we talk about prepositions. And now, little children, abide in, in Him. Not with Him. Not alongside of Him. This is not a, this is not, this is, this is a proximity word, but notice the intention of it. It's not of, I'm right next to Jesus, and he's right next to me, and I'm going to go buddy-buddy, arm-in-arm, down the road in life, and if I run the trouble, it's like, hey, I got Jesus, can you take this from me? No, no, in. It's intentional. It's in. In the Bible, they use this word a lot. In, 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 in. And it talks a lot about in Christ, and we are in him, and he is in us. This is not to say that we aren't going arm-in-arm. Arm. I mean, we've, have you guys seen those t-shirts that says, Jesus is my homeboy? Like, I, I want to go up to them and say, like, do you realize what that means? Like, that means Jesus isn't close enough to you. There's actually another level that we're missing as Christians. When we say yes to Jesus, we enter into life with him, and he enters into life in me. It is, you cannot get closer than a person who embodies us, and we embody them, because we are absolutely a part of them, because we have realized at the core of who we are that I can do nothing apart from Jesus. That's what John talked about last week, John 15, 5. We can't do anything apart from Him. Nothing. Little children abide in Him. So that when He appears, we may have confidence. Not just this self-confidence, not this air of, well, I'm a Christian. I have Jesus in me. I'm going to walk around and I'm going to... It's a certain type of confidence. Confidence and not shrinking back from Him. In this world, you will have trouble, says Jesus. We're going to talk more about that. Do not shrink back from him in shame at his coming. So he's addressing a situation that's going on in the church here. They're getting nervous. They think the end of the world is coming. I know there are times that I think the end of the world is coming. And it causes us to think about things that are important. Think about things that are in the end of days. Think about things that matter. Think about what's most important. And here John is going back to him and says, in light of all this, in light of what's coming, in light of this is what's important, is that we remain in him, is that we abide in him, is that we continue to sit at his feet, continue to learn from him, continue to do our things by the power of Christ in us, not by our actions, not because I'm going to do this and then Jesus is going to help me. It's Jesus does this and here I am a part of it. And I find myself going along with, what are you doing, God? Where is your kingdom at? How are you moving? I can be the legs if you do the rest of it. That's the kind of relationship I want. I don't want to just stumble into things. I want to intentionally go out and say, God, this is what you want me to do. I don't understand why or how you're going to do it, but here I am. I'm being obedient because I have this relationship, because I want this closeness, because I'm spending my life trying to continually grab on to you in a deeper way. Now all of a sudden I'm doing something and I don't necessarily understand it, and that's the beauty. We don't have to understand it. We just have to want it. It gets at our desires. It gets at the core of who we are. That I need you. That's the song we just sang. I depend on you. That's the opposite of what American culture has taught us. When you can YouTube something and become an expert in 15 minutes, I don't depend on God, I depend on the internet service of my phone. Right? Well, that's the reality, and it's a silly reality. But at the same time, we're continually taught that again and again. Be self-reliant, be self-dependent unless you need help. And then if you need help, then good for you, you finally reached a point where you're mature where you can ask for help. But as Christians, we start with that. We say, I can't do anything apart from Jesus. I need you to help me in every aspect. And then God's like, okay, good. Now let's go from here. It's, it's almost reverse. And you know what there is? There's immense freedom in that. To know that Jesus says, I've got you. I'm going to cover you. I'm the one who takes you. I'm the one who drags you with. So, verse 29. If you know that he is righteous... 
you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness have been born of me. So we kind of made mention of this uh, earlier. One of the things that at least I have tended to do when I am trying to do my relationship with Jesus is that it's, I'm just doing it with him kind of just alongside me. He's, 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 there's me and then there's, and there's God. I'm a Christian. I, li I, like, I like having been a Christian. I like being a part of the, the group of Christians. And he's just, he's just here. And when I run into a, a problem, he can, he can step in and do it for me. But I'm, I'm proving, and it's somewhere deep inside of me, I had this realization. I have been, I'm somehow trying to prove to him that he got a good deal when he saved me. That he didn't just pick a loser. That I'm okay, God. Like I, ha I, I bring something to the table. Like I can, I can help you in your kingdom. I can help you do this. I know I'm a sinner. I know that you need to save me from that. I know that you've forgiven me. But Lord, I can, this is what I can bring. And then we start to really think about, I'm not proving anything to God. I'm proving something to myself. Oh, I need to somehow in my life validate that I am not a completely without hope. And that's not what the gospel is about. The gospel is, we have no hope. We have no ability to do anything to, our, to help ourselves. We have nothing to bring. God doesn't need me to accomplish his purposes. But he says, but I will use you. And I can use you if only you, and here's the scariest word, I think, in Christianity, surrender. If I surrender. And that's where I have a hard time because I can hang on with one hand and let go of the other and say that I'm surrendering, but I'm not. Abiding is something we're learning to do. It's something that we're continually practicing to do where it's this idea of I'm laying it down and I'm not sure how this is going to go, but I trust you and I know that you're good. Even if right now I don't fully comprehend it, if I don't fully grasp in the depths of my heart what you are doing, I know that you will show me. And that's why I am depending on you. That's why I'm remaining in you because I've, I've tried other methods and it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. John 15, 5, I mentioned that. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's literally what John says earlier on. And, and at least for me, I need to hear this quite a bit. Because I live in a world where we are trying to do good things. Right? Like, I, no one in the world wakes up and is like, you know what? I'm just going to spite someone today. You know, maybe if we really search. But most people wake up and like, I want to try to be a good person today. But apart from Christ... We can do nothing of actual, eternal good. That's who drives the, who, what I am. That's who drives the world. I may be able to do something nice. There's a big difference between being nice and being good for the sake of God who is good in me. One of these is accomplishing the, sex, the, the idea that I am just a, a person in this world who exists not to deter it. The other side of this being an action, the Christ in me is an action with missional intention that I am out to help spread the kingdom of God because I have realized in my life that I am so in need of help in every aspect of my life and I know a God who has filled that and more to help me do something for His kingdom. And He has saved me and brought me in. It's out of that appreciation, out of that knowledge of that I was completely lost and then He found me, that I was dead and now I'm alive out of that understanding that I want to continually go back to the source of life that never ends, the source of love that will never fail, the source of grace that is new every morning, and take that and say, what else can I, how can I share this, this, this message that has so radically transformed not just who I am, but the way that I live and the way that I see other people? That's, that's what I need to hear, because I can't do anything apart from that. I can't say, Jesus, I got this. Let me do this. I'll come back to you when I need more. It's, God, where are you going? How can I be a part of that thing? It's the fruit of who we are, the fruit of things in Christ in us that shows that's lasting. It's the fruit of Christ in me that is transforming. It's the fruit of Christ in me that does go out and accomplishes mission. It's not me doing things like goodness, kindness, self-control. We know the list. This is Jesus and me saying, here's what I'm going to do through you. And we get to be a part of that as we abide, as we participate in who God is. So, have you guys ever, this is, this is a weird analogy, but apparently this is just a weird analogy sermon. You guys know what I say when I say wake surfing? 
Okay, here's what, for those that don't know, you get a boat and you put a lot of weight in the back so you have this gigantic wake that comes out of your boat. And it's not like uh, skiing or, or wakeboarding. You don't, you, the idea is to get rid of the rope and to just remain in the, the wave kind of like you're surfing, as you would surf. In Minnesota, we don't have waves we can surf on. We just have waves that are like, you know, humps because we're on lakes, right? So the idea is to make an actual wave that you can ride behind a boat. And the goal is to do it as long as you can, which is it's harder than it looks, but it's fun to try. And, and I keep thinking of abiding as this, this analogy where we can get in here and we, we get going and you stand up and you throw the rope back and you're standing there and you're like, this is amazing, this is so much fun. And you start to feel kind of confident. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, if you're not thinking about it, you start to drift out of the wake. And what happens when you drift out of the wake is you'll go this way and you'll start floating and all of a sudden you'll start to sink and sink. And there's no more momentum and the boat goes away and you're sitting floating in a life jacket. And you're, you know what happened, but you feel a little foolish you didn't do it because it's not even, you didn't even do a cool trick and fall, you just kind of floated out and sunk. <laughs> that's, that's, that's me and abiding. That's, that's what it is because I, I, get, I get in this rhythm of life with, with Jesus and I'm like, this is great. I, I'm learning from him. He's showing me so much. And it's like, you know what? I'm, I can do this on my own. And all of a sudden, slowly, slowly, it's never, I mean, never land these immediate right turns and you're down. I mean, that can happen. But we're just slowly drifting out. And it's like, yeah, I got... And all of a sudden we realize, what happened? What happened? Where, where am I? Where is this abiding? And it's this idea. This, no one starts this and is perfect. It's this continually learning again and again. I have to be in the wake. I can't leave the wake. I can't leave what Jesus is doing. I can't leave his presence because it doesn't work. It, it, it doesn't work. I might have a little momentum, but it's not going to work. It doesn't stay that way. I have to remain in where Jesus is. Because apart from that, I'm just going to try things and it isn't going to do anything. It's just me batting at the air. It's just me saying empty things. But if I'm in the wake, if I'm in what Jesus is doing, then, then he starts to do stuff. Then we start to see God do amazing things in the people around us, in the community around us. He starts to do amazing things in ourselves as our hearts are no longer left to where they are. But he continually transforms us and pulls us more into the likeness of him. That's how we know that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Because we can look at him. And you can see... He's got fruit, and I know where that fruit comes from. It's not because he's a really good try-harder person. It's because he abides in Jesus. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason the world does not know us is because it does not know him. Here's where we get to these two no's, these two types of no's. And we need to think about this just a little bit. The reason the world does not know us is because it does not know him. It doesn't recognize Jesus. It doesn't recognize Jesus because it doesn't know him. Are you guys, so I, I'm a, when I fly in airplanes, I'm that guy that no one wants to sit by. I want to talk. Okay? I'm that kind of guy. And I, I like to have conversations because I get to have talk to people all over the world. Like literally all over the world. I've had some really interesting conversations. And I'm praying about this because I'm going to present the gospel because they're never going to see me again. So if it's awkward, it doesn't matter. Right? <laughs> and I have these conversations with people on the airplane. And you know what the most common answer I get back when I talk about Jesus? Uh, you Sometimes it's just absolute silence. They put their earbuds in because they don't want to hear it. Other times it's this... Oh, I've, I've read the Bible, or I've heard about Jesus, and you know what, and, I, and I've weighed the options, and that's fine. If it's fine for you, go for it. If it's not, whatever. That's the most common answer I hear. And it just, it just kind of baffles me, because they just, they just they weigh it out like some factual knowledge, like this is, this is who Jesus is, and I've looked at it, and you know what, that doesn't really fit my lifestyle, so whatever. And my conclusion isn't that they've weighed it well or not. I don't think through, have they actually thought through all the facts and all the knowledge? Have they read the certain verses? I mean, that's there. But my biggest thought has been, but they don't actually know what it's like to abide in Jesus. They don't, they don't actually know what it's like to come before Jesus in times of trouble, in times of, of goodness, in times of, of gathering at church. They don't know what it's like to sit there and just be like, 
thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And to feel the love of Jesus wash over us, to feel the grace that in spite of everything that I've done and everything that I'm going to do, he still loves me. To, to actually have that abiding, they don't act, I, there's no way that you could feel that and then continue to say, yeah, I've thought about it, it's not worth it. They, they just don't get it. It's this knowing. They don't know him. They don't know Jesus. They may know things about him, but they haven't experienced it. They haven't understood the gospel. They haven't had that manifest in their hearts to a degree where they actually know Jesus' grace. That's different than just saying, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard about that guy. I've, I've been to churches where not, there's this and this and this, and all the excuses we've heard. They don't, they don't know him. And this is why John specifically says, see what kind of love. He doesn't just say, see the love the Father has, has shown. See the kind of love that he has given to us that we should be called children of God. This isn't a title I have just assumed. This isn't a title I've just been like, yep, I'm just going to call myself a child of God because it sounds cool. God has chosen and called us this because of the certain type of, the certain kind of love with which he has loved us. It is a love that is foreign to the world. It is a love the world does not understand. And it is a love that we receive everlasting and infinitely forever and ever. The love that calls us the children of God is the love that has adopted us into the family of God. It is a love that has not left us lost or left us dead, but is a love that has given up of his own self where God sent his son to the world to seek and to save that was lost, which is everybody. We are all sick in need of a doctor, is what Matthew says, and we are all to the point where we need help. And God says, I love you enough that I'm going to enter into the world, put on flesh, and to seek and to save and to die a death so that you may know that I love you and I, may, and I will make a way so that you can be with me forever. John Piper has an analogy where he, he says that it's like standing before the judge and Jesus comes and he pays the penalty. He dies the death. The blood has covered our sins and we're sitting there thinking I'm, I, all the evidence says I'm, I'm done. All the evidence says I should go away for a life. All the evidence says I should be put in the electric chair. I have nothing to, to do and, and somehow this guy has come and he's paid the penalty and taken it all away and I'm just flabbergasted at this and the judge banks his gavel and I'm overwhelmingly feeling this sense of relief of how did that happen? Who was going to do this? Why was something so crazy? And then the judge gets down from the stand and walks up to you and grabs you in a hug and says, and by the way, I'm adopting you as my son and you have all of the riches that I have at your disposal because I love you. It doesn't comprehend with us because that's so otherworldly and so bizarre that someone would do that. And not just someone, but God himself. That's a kind of love. And that's the kind of love that doesn't just make us feel warm and fuzzy, but it's the kind of love that transforms us into children of God. Children of God himself. And we get to abide with him, to remain with him, to sit at his feet and to, and to, to ask him questions and to feel that. And then we're going to do nothing with it. He has given it to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. That is, and the reason the world does not know us is because it does not know him. Because the world says that is foolishness. Foolishness. And to a person who doesn't understand it, yeah, it is foolishness. So maybe you will wonder, so what does this look like? If you flip back to John 15, this is a kind of a parallel passage. And maybe if you want to go home and do some reading, read John 15. Because that passage is where John started last week and really talks more about that. And in there, it goes a step further talking about as we are children of God, as we are called children of God, as we abide in Him, Jesus says, do not be surprised if the world hates you. If the world hates you because it hated me first. It doesn't understand things in the world. It doesn't understand what love is about. And sometimes we don't understand it, so that's why we must continue to abide so that we can best portray that. That we can best share the gospel of Jesus came so that we may have life and life abundantly. Jesus came so that we have grace. That's what we need. It doesn't understand it because it doesn't know him. But what if I could introduce you to him and then you might understand it? Then you might understand it. I think of a story of a pastor who, before he was a pastor, before he was a Christian, he would go into churches and he wanted to prove Christianity wrong. 
And so he would take all these super elaborate notes and write out these proofs of this is why it's wrong, and this is why God doesn't exist. And obviously his life changed, God saved him. And he's a pastor, and he tells this story. And he goes, honestly, I didn't even get all my questions answered, but I know that Jesus loves me. I know that he died for me, and there's nothing in the world I would trade for it. Because that's, that's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. That that abiding supersedes all knowledge, all other things of this world, all wisdom in this world, because it is just the most important thing that we can have. God's wisdom and God's love and God's knowledge and the knowledge of Him in me, it, it is greater than anything in this world can ever offer. There is nothing that compares to it. And this is why in verse 2, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know when it happens, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Christians have this, really, this wonderful gift of, of, of anticipation. And sometimes we get nervous, anticipation makes us sometimes antsy, at least for me it does, like when I order something from Amazon and it takes two days, like with, I get really nervous and worked up about that. But with Christianity, we have this anticipation of the now, and we call it the not yet. There is a reality of truth in the world now that we are children of God, that we are at the feet of God, abiding in Jesus constantly. He has transformed us. We have forgiveness. We have love. We have grace. We have mercy. We have the power of God in us to do work for His kingdom, of His purpose, and His ways. But yet, there is coming a day when there will be something even greater. Well, how can it be greater than now? It will be greater. It will be better. It will be more. It will be beyond our understanding. We can try to paint pictures. I think the reason the Bible doesn't go into all this detail about heaven is because we lack the words necessary to describe the wonder and beauty of what is coming. But I do know that there will be a day when I get to be with Christ, and He will appear, and we will get to be with Him. There will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. All of the greatness of heaven, but the one biggest joy that I have is that I will get to see Jesus as He is. As He is, and I get to stand with Him face to face, and to walk with Him, to talk with Him, as it was way back in the Garden of Eden. I want that, I long for that, and that is what we look forward to the most. Because sin will be gone. Pain will be erased. There will be no more of that. And the reason that's so important is because it does not separate us anymore from our God. And we get to be His people, His children, in an even greater sense than we are now. Beloved. We are God's children now. Beloved is a term. It's a title. That's what He refers to us as the Beloved. So, which is one of the reasons why we tie so well in. We always say that when we get to Communion Sunday. Oh, it ties so well into Communion. Because the reality is, is it does. Everything in the Bible, everything gospel-related ties back into Communion, which is why we celebrate it regularly. Which is why we do it together. I was just reading something, and in, uh, if you read the, the old Jewish laws way back in the day, uh, you were not allowed to celebrate the Passover by yourself. You were not allowed to because it misses the point. And it's the same type of purpose here with communion. We, we don't celebrate this alone in our homes because that's not the point of it. The point of it is as we look around, we are in this together. We are the family of God who as a body of the church of Jesus who is the head, we have all been transformed. We all want to abide. We all want to remain in Him. And we intentionally do this every month so that we can remember that, so that we can reflect on that, so that we can take a physical representation and say, this is what Jesus did for me. I need this not just once a month, but this is the reminder for me every single time. We covered a lot today, and I hope it made a little sense. But if you don't, please... John and I want this to be a conversation we continually have throughout the weeks. I want to know more about that. Great, you said this, it didn't make any sense. I figured, please ask me. Let's talk more about that. It would be, we, we want that. We want to engage in that conversation because it has been such a joy in my life to learn to abide, to learn what it means to continually sit at the feast of Jesus, to be in Christ, not just by Him, not just next to Him, but to be in Christ. It's a difference of life-giving relationship in, in a church or a, a lifetime of trying to please and trying to do something that's just part of a mere club. 
Jesus is far more than that. Let's pursue Christ together and know him well. Have a great Sunday, guys. Talk to you later.